Hello, friends and listeners, and welcome to Get a Cat, Get a Horse. The gosh darn best nerd culture podcast around. I'm Will. And I'm a Manny. And today is episode 19, Suicide Squad. I was going to make like a suicide pun in there, but that might be a little uh, offensive. I don't know. But uh, Yeah, I feel like that's a safe... Like, I feel like you made the right choice just now. stay away from area. Yeah, and so yeah. I hear from the, from the chortling in the background to my awesome joke, I hear that we might have a return guest this week. Welcome back. Oh my god. Ethan. He liked it so much. He's back. <laughs> He's back. Say hi. So nice we had to um, have him on twice. It's Ethan. <laughs> yes, I'm here and my nose is bleeding. <laughs> Why is your nose bleeding? I don't know. <laughs> oh He's no, just it, so, it, it like, was ramped the up. movie did it to him. Yeah, it, it really yeah. did. Oh my god, it did. <laughs> wow. So today we are going to discuss with our bestie Bestie with testes, Ethan. We're going yes, to discuss. Me. Yep, we're going to discuss Suicide Squad in all of its glory and how uh, it made us feel, and how it made the employees so of feelings. WB feel, and how it, it makes the, the, everybody else feel. Lots of feels, all the feels. Who yeah. knew Suicide Squad would be had all the feels? Yeah, would like make us feel these things that it's making us feel. We should talk I about certainly this. didn't, for one. <laughs> uh, so, do you guys saw the movie separately, as I understand it? Yeah. Yeah, we did. Ethan but did it, you I see it with other? You saw it with other people, I'm assuming, right? Yeah. 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 yeah we went with. Friends. What was your theatrical experience? Because I saw it with my with my friend from Trader Joe's, who and I usually when I go to see movies for the podcast, I tend to kind of see him. On my own because I see him at weird times since I work nights. But this was the first one that I saw with my friend, and I found it uh, uh, quite nice to have somebody there to like, kind of turn to and be like, "What the actual fuck is going on?" So, <laughs> what's the actual experience like because that was that was good to have a crutch for me. Yeah. Ethan, why don't you go first? Okay. Yeah. So, um, me and my friend Jose, uh, we won free tickets from T-Mobile. T-Mobile oh. did this thing where like. Uh, they give out they gave out tickets to Suicide Squad to basically all their customers, which maybe speaks for the fact that Suicide Squad couldn't sell tickets. <laughs> I don't know, but um, we so me, my friend Jose, my friend Eric, we went to go watch it, and we pretty much unanimously felt that it was horrible. <laughs> it was like a hot mess. <laughs> it was a hot mess, but you know what? Like I will say that like we did pay attention just because there were like a few characters that we really liked. Like, we like female char- characters typically, obviously. Like, there were, like, a lot of those. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so we paid attention. There was a moment at the end of the movie <laughs> where I... I never do this. Please don't judge me. But it got to the point where it was like, it's like, come on, like, let's finish the movie. And I had to check my phone. So I put my phone at the lowest light. And I, like, put it inside of my helmet because I rode my scooter there. And I was, like, checking it. <laughs> And this, like, tall, like, slender man came up to me. And he was like, can you please put that away? Really? And I was just like, I was just like, it's just like, we're not watching Schindler's List. Like, (laughs) what experience are you trying to, like, protect right now? (laughs) It's just like, Cara Delevingne has turned into, like, a weird witch and she's dancing. Like, I... (laughs) But yeah, I think I can experience. check my phone. Yeah, relax. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I went a couple of days later on a Tuesday um, in Utah, where we live. They have, or at least in Provo, I'm not sure if it's in all of Utah, but where we live, they have $5 Tuesdays at like all of the local theaters. Yeah, so that's what ours was movie too. For $5. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. I love that. I think that's so great. So I went on a Especially Tuesday with my Especially for this kind friend. of trash. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I went on a Tuesday. I went with a friend, and another, uh, I went with two friends. And I just remember sighing a lot, like mm-hmm. in the theater. Yeah, there was yeah. just a lot of like, <sighs> like going on. <laughs> and every time I would do that, my two friends would just like break out laughing. And you could tell like the ladies in front of us for like not having a good time. <laughs> I will say though that five dollar Tuesday, like the theater was packed. Like it was completely yeah. full. Everybody went to see Suicide Squad. It's definitely going to, like, financially, like, be fine, you know? Oh, yeah, I mean, it made a lot of money. The uh-huh. It already, it was a $175 million budget, and within the first weekend, it had already, I think, hit 280 
and it broke. Well, girl, um, T-Mobile bought all the tickets. <laughs> That's true. T-Mobile bought all the tickets. It was uh, Catherine Zeta Jones or whoever was their spokesperson. She bought them all. <laughs> um, she can afford it. <laughs> she she probably can. Yeah. Um, so, what about your theater yeah, so experience? It, I mean, mine was mine was probably similar to you. I saw it like a little bit earlier in the day on a Tuesday. Like, pro- I, like a th- there were so many showings at the theater near me. I mean, there were probably like between three D and not three D. There were probably like le- le- legitimately. Oh my god, I can't talk. Twenty showings yes, of the film, like on that one day. So, I saw it a bit like in the afternoon on a Tuesday, and uh, the theater actually was much less full than I thought. Um, and I, I sort of chalk that up to the fact that this is one of those movies that I think is going to have a massive opening weekend because there's a, a contingent of, of people that will go see it, you know, regardless of who says what about it. And then the fallout, or the fall off, rather, of the ticket sales will probably be pretty steep because once, like, word of mouth and, uh, and critical reviews kind of circulate amongst people who, you know... Like, there's always going to be like $150 million worth of ticket sales on something like this, you know, mm. even if it is as, as bad as, as this movie, you know, was to me, um, like it, you're always going to have some, those people in there. But anyway, I was surprised that like my theater was relatively empty. I saw it with my friend, um, like I said, from Trader Joe's. And then we went to uh, dinner afterwards and just sort of like mold over what we had seen. And, I mean, most of the time, like, there were just things going on that I was just turning to her, and she was looking at me, and I was literally, I mean, I, I, so many of the, so many times during this movie, I was just like, what the fuck is happening? And and that's coming from a place of, like, relative, I mean, I'm not going to say that I'm, like, a Suicide Squad aficionado, but I have, like, a relative understanding of of some of these characters, or most of them, and, like, how they have kind of worked in the past, and I still mm-hmm. was just, like what the hell is this? I mean, mo- like, most of the things that they chose to do and, you know, the way that they chose to show it to you, like, was just honestly baffling and, like, confusing to me. And my friend, who is not a big comic book person, like, I've I've given her some comic books in the past and she's read one or, one or two, but... And she's, like, you know, into the movies, but she's not a actual, like, reader of the books or, or really goes any further... She basically described it, which I thought was pretty apt when we were having dinner. She was like, yeah, I was, like, watching a, a scratched DVD. Like, everything was just skipping around, and I had no idea why. <laughs> and I didn't know what was going on half the time. And I was like, yeah, I kind of felt similar to that. So yeah. my opinion overall was was very negative, and it sounds like your, yours guys was as well. Yeah, it looks like we're going to have a unanimous review of this <laughs> yeah lots of big words yeah <laughs> and by by negative i mean this movie i think was is easily easily the worst superhero comic book movie adaptation i've ever seen and i think probably the worst movie that i can think can like remember watching in the last okay. like, year like, like i thought on. it was <laughs> I thought Wait. it was just. <laughs> Wait, can, can we talk about Electra horrendous. with Jennifer Gardner? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think this is absolutely worse than the Daredevil and Electra movies. Oh my gosh! Actually, I might agree with you. <laughs> I definitely don't agree. Yeah. I think Batman v Superman was one of the worst That's, things yeah. I've ever like experienced in my natural born life. <laughs> and I have a oh, this is way worse. Why. Than me. Well, I All I right. feel like Batman v Superman it. was like. It's cardinal sin is the worst sin, in my opinion, for me, that a movie can be, which is, like, mind-numbingly, painfully, excruciatingly boring. Yeah. Like, there was nothing yeah. interesting or fun for me about Batman v Superman, and Suicide Squad was way more infuriating to me because I felt like there was a lot of things that were actually fun but there was such a shit show getting the fun onto the screen that it just ended up, like... It's like a runner who like has ev- who's like in a great is in great shape like has been training like has every there's no reason they shouldn't win the race and they like trip over themselves and like the first mm-hmm. step and like end up yeah. breaking every single bone in their body but still tries to run yeah but, but, but then tries to like finish the race <laughs> yeah like, I agree with that I think about Suicide Squad I, I think that's probably true like it had more 
it it probably was its own undoing in a lot of ways more than yeah. other movies. Yeah, you're right. Like it wasn't necessarily boring, but like the things that it tried to do were just so messy and poorly executed and childlike. Like yeah. really like childlike thinking about story and storytelling. Yeah. Which which yeah. like really surprised me cuz whatever you want to say about Batman v Superman, there were some well cut like filmmaking scenes in that yeah movie. no i i think that like i said i think batman vs superman was like was i didn't like it and i still thought it was leagues more enjoyable than this <laughs> i i disagree but like i think i feel like that's like neither here nor there you know what i mean like it doesn't yeah. matter which is worse because they were both pretty fucking bad yeah you know yeah yeah we should talk about so, why we dislike it yes we why should. So bad. <laughs> i mean to me, like, I I just felt like on a fundamental storytelling and filmmaking, uh, like, level of, of, like, showing you information that you needed, conveying what it was trying to say in understandable, like, visual language, I just thought it was a complete failure. Like, I didn't, half the time, the characters on screen, I didn't know who they were or why they were talking to each other. Like, the first 30 minutes of the film is Amanda Waller, who, like, isn't really introduced talking mm-hmm. to unnamed random generals who aren't introduced and like weird people in you like Pentagon boardrooms who aren't introduced with like just binders that say top secret, like all over the fucking place. They're just like throwing binders around of top secret shit everywhere. <laughs> and I was like, what the, like that is the, like the laziest type of visual storytelling is when you just yeah. like put the word on top of something and then just like throw it around. So there's like, Top secret stuff that I'm supposed to be kind of interested in. There's all these random nonsense military things happening. Like, I... It just, honestly, it felt like they had all of these bits to a story. And then, I don't know if it was, like, destroyed in the editing room. Or if it was, you know, just bad from the beginning. But, like, just their ability to convey information to me was just horrendous. I never actually had a firm grasp or understanding of, like, why anybody was doing what they were doing and who all of these unnamed people were. Well, that was my, think, like, like, chief complaint with it. To Yeah, to, like, jump off of that, like, you can tell from, like, I could tell from, like, the very first two scenes, which was a Deadshot scene and then a Harley Quinn scene, where they were very <laughs> it much, was, like, Yeah, it was secretly a Deadshot movie, by the way. Yeah, it was secretly a Deadshot movie, and it wasn't, like, even, like, a good Deadshot movie. It was, like, a shitty Deadshot movie. <laughs> And, like, the very first scene was, like, hey, look, Deadshot is, like, a badass. And, hey, look, like, Harley Quinn's, like, super sexy. Like, you're welcome, fans. Like, that's what the first two scenes were. And they were just complete missteps. Like, there was nothing subtle about it. Like, like, wasn't the guard kind of rapey and weird? I, don't, I really yeah. got turned off in that yeah, first and scene. Yeah, and spo- he was, like, supposed to be the funny character in the movie. And he, like, totally he didn't was fit. Just, he wasn't ugh. funny. He didn't make any sense. He was, like, really stupid. But that's not, like... And then they cut to the Amanda Waller scene, which was actually shot, interestingly. She Like, Viola Davis is a badass. She can carry any scene she's in. And that actually, like, felt like the beginning of the movie. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's, like, pretty mm-hmm. indicative of, like, the whole experience where it's just these vignettes of these bad guys. And they're and constantly the filmmakers were just, like, looking out at the audience and being like, look, we're giving you what you want. It's Harley Quinn being funny. Yeah, yeah. And all of the audience is like, well, actually, like, she's not funny. And, like, you're an idiot. It's like, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. Ethan, what do you think? No, I agree. It was really disappointing because there's obviously a lot more happening here than I think they wanted us to think that we believe like obviously these people have been locked up for years but like they're like suddenly like wearing sexy clothing and just being like (laughs) yeah exactly look at me i'm completely like will smith is like ripped like (laughs) 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 it's just like it it was and oh the thing you were talking about will where, where you were like they're just tossing out these like rich white like like, military officials with no names and, like, documents with top secret things. And, like, it was just really confusing for the first 20 minutes. I had no idea what was was going on. And as someone who doesn't really, like, I I never read the Suicide Squad comic book. I was, or comic books, I was just really confused. Um, I mean, obviously... I finished it. I finished the movie. Like, you I, did it. I like, did it. Congratulations. <laughs> um, you know, I honestly, yeah, good on you for that. So bad. 
Oh, yeah. thank you so Ethan, much. Ethan, you are so brave. <laughs> um, but I will say, me and my friends had a good laugh for the first, like, 30 minutes just watching, like, Cara Delevy and, like, trying to, like, act. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude. Holy shit, she was bad. Holy so- shit. Oh, my favorite scene. My favorite scene in the whole movie. Because, so, if you don't know audience, Cara Delevingne is a very famous model, like, very wealthy, very famous. The only reason she got this job is because she's pretty and because her family's rich. It's the only reason. There is a scene where uh, Viola Davis is like, okay, Enchantress, you better turn into her. And she's like, <laughs> she's like, okay. And she, like, turns into the Enchantress and go gets, like, Guitar- a file. A file. A top secret a file. Top secret <laughs> file. <laughs> that, that, that's in, like, who carries files and actual, like, paper folders? <laughs> like, but she, like, goes to get it and, like, throws it on the on the table. And she's, like, sexually, like, touching touching this man. But at the any, anyway, like, Viola Davis is, like, okay, Enchantress. Like, bring us back Dr. Moon or whatever. And she's, like, oh, fine. And, like, Dr. Moon comes back. And it's Carrie Delvey. And she's trying to act. And she's, like, what happened? I don't know what happened. And yeah, she, like, know, runs yeah. off screen. <laughs> And the act, like the Rick Flag character, like the actor is just like, oh my god! Like you can see it on his face. He's like, what the fuck have I gotten myself into? He's just holding like this distraught Cara Delevingne and trying to like get her off screen like as quickly as possible. <laughs> so bad. Yeah. So I mean, like the actual the actual way that the story, I guess, was supposed to like work was that you know you spend about thirty or forty minutes getting introduced to all of these uh, kind of characters and it. It kind of feels like they they wanted to go for, I mean, I don't know what kind of, like, you know, one of those, like, getting the band back together kind of movies where they're doing, like, all these little cuts and you can see, like, their stats they wanted and everything. To do, they wanted to do Guardians of the Galaxy mixed with the Dark Knight. Yeah. Like, yeah. that's yeah. what they were going for. That's true. Completely yeah. not understanding that one is oil and one is water. And you cannot have both. <laughs> you can't and mix it's them. It's not the way and, they tried to do it. None the two shall mix. Yeah, and yeah. so, like, they... They spend all this time. So that was, my my favorite part of the movie was, or my, my favorite part in just like how stupid it was, was they spend all this time and all of this effort like reinforcing how how these characters are in like this Louisiana slum hole prison and how bad it is and stuff. And then by the time they finally get them together to get out like on the mission, as they're about to get the helicopter, a car rolls up and they're like. Oh yeah, this is like Mr. Grapple Man. He can fucking climb anything. And I was like, "What? Like, what is this guy?" <laughs> I know. And, then, like, this chick... and then this chick gets oh, off God. of like a plane, and there's like, "Oh yeah," and she's Katana, the the like, Japanese mercenary who's characters. like got my back has, all the time. Like, and I'm like, a Who demonic the fuck sword. Are these? Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's like, just what? What happened the in this? And then of forgot. course, <laughs> yeah, it made no sense. And then the Grapple guy, like. Is in the movie for all five minutes, and his superpower yeah, like is like scenes. having dude, his superpower <laughs> is grappling having hooks. grappling hooks. Like it's like oh he can climb anything. It's like yeah because he has a fucking grappling hook. Like yeah he can <laughs> climb anything. And so <laughs> he's in the movie for two seconds, at which point he tries to grapple away and oh proves gosh. how utterly useless and stupid he is, and just blows up and dies. I was like, what <laughs> in the hell what am I watching? It was oh so nonsensical. Her name should have been like Human Legend of Zelda. Like, <laughs> just, like he like found the grappling hook and was like, "Well, I guess I'm a superhero now." Yeah, he's like, "All right, now, now, where's all my grapple points? Like, where, where can I go now?" Like, he was. It um, was so stupid. Can I like jump in here? Ethan said Absolutely. something kind of funny where he was like, for the first like 30 minutes or so, like me and my friends were like laughing and like having a good time. And I felt that way too. Like the first 30 minutes were like badly made and stupid, but I was also like, okay, but like this is like kind of bad, like funny. Like this is like bad, yeah, but it's, I can, like fun, I can see bad. That. And yeah. I remember them getting to the part where they like have them all like in that open compound and they mm-hmm. introduce grappling hook guy and like they're all like getting suited up and like, oh, like this movie is shit, but like at least it's moving along, yeah. you know, like and at then least it they're becomes not, like, wasting stunningly my time. Stunningly unfun. Yeah, I remember them like, I remember specifically having the thought like, this isn't that bad. Like, okay, like it's terrible, but yeah. it's like clipping along and it's like funny that it's this bad and it's like enjoyably funny. Um, and then from that point on, 
it just like descends into like utter like chaos. chaos. Like the movie yeah. just like takes a pill and just like starts undressing and like running through the streets naked. And like <laughs> <laughs> it like it like popped yeah. like five tabs of acid. And it's just, <laughs> and it's just, just like, like let's do this. <laughs> And it just like took a like a dark, scary turn, yeah. right? And I remember just being frustrated with it on so many levels. But the thing that was most frustrating to me, and I don't know if you guys agree, but I felt like Harley Quinn was like the most frustrating character in the movie. Yeah. Because Margot Robbie killed it. She did. She really yeah. like I feel like she really like encapsulated that sort of like crazy. Yeah, that, that, especially good. like from the original Harley Quinn in the Batman cartoon, like she really felt like that character to me. And they gave her the shittiest lines and the shittiest action. Like mm-hmm. she was constantly like being like she would constantly like do something crazy and then like turn to the camera and go like, but I'm a bad guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that was like her being funny. Yeah. And she did it like six times. And I was just like holy hell, like, you obviously don't understand any of these characters, which really, like, it it pulled into stark contrast. Like, listen, like, it's not the actors. Like, these actors are trying their best. I felt like Will Smith mm-hmm. gave, for what he was given, he gave us all a performance. You did. I, like, I can't, I don't know about the Joker, like, this whole, like, Jared Leto thing, like, whether he's a good <laughs> or not. I don't have anything to say about it. Because the I felt like the script was so terrible that there's no way to know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I no, I mean, I, I agree. Like, I think the set. oh yeah, the yeah. actors were like certainly underserved the by the film, except for Kira especially Dillon, Margot Robbie. Who, like, immediately should be recast. <laughs> yeah, Margot Wait, Robbie was, I, like, was the shining star. Cara Delevingne like didn't deserve to be. Margot Robbie, oh, yeah. she was, was she was awful. Yeah, Margot Robbie anyway, was. I you... think she was very good. Um, I mean, I think the moment the movie goes like the moment that I like pinpoint just how terrible the movie is is when Will Smith is kind of standing around with everybody and he like turns to the camera and he goes like, "So, is this some kind of Suicide Squad?" And I was like, "Oh, oh, 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 oh we went there!" Oh my god! Oh my god! It's the name of the movie. It's the name of the movie. He said it. Oh my god! Like, oh man! It. No, like I think. Can I, I yeah, tell I think you Will my Smith... favorite part of the movie? Oh yeah, go for it. Okay, my favorite part of the movie, this is when I knew, like, it was just a shit show, and I was, like, never coming back from it. It's when they're in that weird, like, it's the first, like, big city set. They're in that, like, uh, like they're in that street, and there's all those cars, uh-huh. and it's the first time you see the magical, like, blobby monsters. Yeah, yeah. And they're all, like, being covert, and Rick Flag's, like, on his, on his radio, and he's like... <laughs> Like we found them, <laughs> and uh, and uh, Amanda Waller's like, Kr! like you need to leave, like you can't fight them, you know that doesn't work, and he's like, Kr! okay, and then he goes to his team, and he's like, okay, half of you like leave, and then the rest of us are just gonna like stand here, like we're not gonna like hide, <laughs> we're but we're just there. gonna like stand here, like stare at them, oh my goodness, and then so they do that for like a minute, and then the villains are like talking to each other, like hey, we're gonna like escape and whatever, all right. Wink, and then that was when Will Smith's Man character. Dies. Yeah, that's when Gravel Man dies, and then like Will Smith's character just starts walking towards the monsters, like super, super slow, and it's like a minute and a half of him like walking past like Rick Flag and being like, "What's up, Rick Flag? Like I'm just gonna like walk towards them. Is that cool?" And Rick Flag's like, "Yeah, like of course, like <laughs> dude, like I'm not here to like tell you what to do or anything." <laughs> and then like they they notice him. It takes them five minutes to <laughs> notice, notice them. them. <laughs> they notice him, and then they all attack, and then everybody's like, "Oh shit, they're attacking!" <laughs> it was like it was like bad AI in a game. <laughs> yeah, it was, and I was yeah. like, "Oh my god!" Like there are no rules. Like Wait, there's no logic. here. Also, something that bothered me is Viola Davis said that thing where she was like, "You know, you know, you can't attack them." Like whatever, and, and they're all like, like, "No, yeah, we know," <laughs> but also like, like, "Let's attack them." <laughs> Oh my goodness it was such a mess it was just like like five minutes of the scene just like saying one thing and doing another which i thought was like yeah. really indicative of the rest of the movie where they would keep like saying things about their character arcs or saying things about the action and then like proving themselves wrong or like going against it like literally in the same scene like a second later mm-hmm. well and some of those characters literally the whole movie didn't do anything killer croc yeah killer croc um, did nothing he did nothing. And that scene where Except he's like, at the like end, swimming when through he's like, oh, the I want thing, like, BET. 
I was like, okay. Fuck is this? <laughs> I guess. Like, I, you haven't done anything yet, so I guess we'll let you do that. I thought the scene where he was, like, swimming through the sewer was, like, really cool. And it was, like, literally five seconds. Yeah. And yeah. it was, like, the coolest thing. And it, it just goes to show, like, the stuff with Diablo at the end where he's, like, turns into that weird thing. Like, that was sick. <laughs> when he you rips know? his like, skin off and turns into a literal demon for a second. Yeah, like, that was amazing, right? Like, there are moments in this movie where it's like, wow, if you had, like, actually capitalized on this thing that makes this character awesome, you would have had a good movie. Like, it was, it was right in front of you. You even, like, had all the pieces in front of you. You just couldn't, like, p- fit the puzzle together. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? They literally had a puzzle and, like, knew, like, how they're supposed to do it, but decided to, like, not, like, to, like fit it together on purpose and like glue it together and <laughs> not, not take the time to piece it together um it's really sad yeah it was really sad it's like depressing yeah, it's, watching this movie somebody brought up uh, an interesting thing it was a video on ign which i i didn't really actually i like, think about when i was watching it but i was like yeah he's he was correct and it was that the this movie actually like fundamentally at its core level misunderstands what suicide squad is because in yes. the mm-hmm. yes. in the in the essence of it like it is supposed to be or has been i'm not going to say supposed to be because i guess it could be different for anything but like as people understand it to be it is meant to be these kind of like crazy unhinged characters who are doing things to get time off of their sentences and part of, like, the reason why we're even doing this, like, why you would even send a bunch of weirdos in there is because it's supposed to be stuff, they're supposed to deal with things that the U.S. government thinks is too hot to touch. Yeah. Yeah. And they, like, don't want to, and then, you know, there's a scene where Amanda Waller's like, oh, well, if they get caught, we'll just, like, disavow them and it doesn't matter. And then, simultaneously, they send, like, 24 Marines in with them. So, like, the government mm-hmm. is already there. Like, you already have a bunch of like, normal-ass soldier guys who are just, like, dudes who the government, you know, is is controlling or or is responsible for. And then you but also like, send a that, weird chick like, with, like, a hammer. Like, yeah. why would you do that uh, with them? Like, it doesn't... Like, it's not like this is an area or whatever. It's not like the Suicide Squad's being used in some way where they're like, oh, this is, like, the craziest thing we've ever seen and we don't want us to have any involvement with it. They're just like, oh no, just go along with these other like boring ass white bearded marine guys and like see what you can do and with a hammer and like grapple hooks. Like, wh- like why would you but do like, What is the point of it? But like even more so than that, like whoever wrote the movie didn't even like try and like give them something to deal with that like makes the team make sense. Yeah, it makes sense like, for Enchantress, them. Enchantress, yeah, yeah. who was part of the team, who was Amanda Waller's first recruit was the problem of the movie and they spent half the movie not even trying to stop fucking enchantress they tried to get amanda waller out of a building yeah like that was them like being suicide squad it's like oh hey there's like this witch and she's like you know like destroying cars and like making like trash magic (laughs) but amanda waller like 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 yolo and then they get to the building and there's no monsters there Oh, I yeah, guess there were a few, weird. but, like, she yeah. could have escaped. But Amanda Waller was, like, the most evil. She, like, shoots all of her friends. She yeah. could have easily, like, gotten herself out of that building. Like, yeah. let's be real. Amanda <laughs> Waller was harder than any of the villains in that movie. Like, she was more evil. Like, she did worse things. Like, they were so crazy scared of making the villains unlikable that they didn't have any fun with them. It's like they're immediately, like, misunderstood. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, they were so yeah, the afraid. Yeah, villains were super boring. Yeah, they were, like, so, like, PC. That scene where Deadshot was, like, on the phone, like, give me my money. Like, it was, like, A, that's, like, not how bank transfers work. You're right. (laughs) (laughs) Your cell service must be fucking amazing. (laughs) Like, and and B, like, you shouldn't make him likable. Like, that should be, like, a hard-ass hitman, like, killing a bunch of people. Like, that should be your introduction to the character. Yeah, he didn't seem evil at all. Like, I was just like, this guy isn't a villain. It was also, like, a massive mistake to make his daughter aware that he was, like, a murderer. Like, can you imagine how much more conflicting it would have been if he had to, like, be that person in secret and then, like, also be, like, a good dad to his daughter who has no idea any of this is going on? You know? Like, there's an interesting story. But, of course, we don't get that. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like... (laughs) So, speaking of bad villains, let's get into, uh, into the Joker. 
because I, oh, right. I personally thought that this was, like, far and away the worst Joker I can remember seeing. Like, I, I just could not, I, like, Jared Leto, and I was reading about it yesterday, and I was like, you sound like such a prick. Let me read you what he said. He, he describes his role as nearly Shakespearean and a beautiful disaster of a character. He says, I took a pretty deep dive, but this was a unique opportunity, and I couldn't imagine doing it any other way. It was fun to play these psychological games. He never broke character, okay, before spent you, time before alone you... listening to gospel music from the 1920s, commenting that he senses the Joker may be much older than people think. That's the Joker we're dealing with here. Wait, we have more to add. Like, don't worry. <laughs> Apparently, he was, like, an absolute nightmare on set two. Like, he was method acting, and he was the Joker, like, the entire time. Both Margot Robbie and David Ayer were like, yeah, he was, like, scary to work with. Uh. Um, didn't Our friend Jose was telling us that, like, he would send, like, crazy presents to all the cast and crew, like, like feces and, like, dead fish and well, stuff. And Viola Davis was like, mm, please stop. <laughs> yeah, like, Viola Davis was the <laughs> only stop. one who was like, 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 fuck you, like, you're not actually <laughs> acting right now, like, stop sending Well, he, he comes from, like, what, a music background, right? He was yeah. in a band. He's a good actor. Like, he's in other stuff, and he's... Oh, he is, okay, he is actually a good actor. I don't care how good of an actor you are, as soon as you self-describe yourself as, like, Shakespearean... Shakespearean. It's like, yeah, go exactly. kill yourself. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> you're, like, human garbage. Like, honestly, I bet you when he goes to a coffee shop, he's a nightmare. Like... <laughs> <laughs> he is. Oh, my he gosh. Is so, oh, man. So, I mean, he, uh, so just on top of all of that. like, known for being kind of crazy, too. So, like, he probably brought I, this out. I don't know. In Jared Leto. Like, I bet this was, like, a group effort. Yeah. So, on top of all of the, you know, all of that crap, what was actually, like, produced on screen as a result of that in no way lives up or could have ever been worth what they're talking about him doing. Like... And I and like you said, I don't know if it's a fault of the direction and the editing, because the scenes in the Joker were the scenes with the Joker in them were literally nonsensical to me. Like like it starts yeah. out with him just being in a room, and they're like, "Oh, Harley Quinn's in love with him," and without any indication of their relationship previously, she's just in a room, and he's like, "I need a machine gun." She's like, "Okay." And then he breaks out, <laughs> and, he, like, and they're just in another room without any indication of what they've been doing previously. She's strapped to an electric table, and he just, like, shocks her, which was weird. And then she becomes, like, a go-go girl slash stripper at a club that Common comes to, and he's like, oh, I, I want to do business That's with common. you, Joker. And Joker's like, do you want to sleep with my girlfriend? And he's like, nah. And then he's like, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> like, what the shit? What is going And then for no reason after that, oh they're in a gosh. chemical plant together. And he's like, oh, do you love me? And she's like, yeah. And then he's like, die for me. And she jumps into chemicals, and then he starts to walk away, and he's like, ah, nah. And he jumps in after her, and then they, like, make out in chemicals for, like, a minute. And then it ends. And I was like, what the hell happened with any of those scenes? I mean, none of them made any sense contextually. None of them had any of the things explained what were going on. It was just a bunch of, like, stupid, right. like... Well, and, like, it was why did Margot shit? Robbie keep bringing up pudding? Like, <laughs> where was the pudding? <laughs> oh, my it God. No, I, I totally, shit. I totally felt the exact same way. It was, like, they were very clear that, like... And you've seen all of, like, the, the memes of, like, Harley Quinn and Joker, like, yeah. hashtag relationship goals, and how, like, everybody who, like, knows the history of those characters... Yeah, it, it was exactly no. like that. It was like they like, took that, five memes the... and, like, put them shittily on the screen. And I feel like that is actually related to another thought I had about Harley Quinn, which actually makes me the most upset, yeah. which was that they didn't understand that like Harley Quinn's sexuality and Harley Quinn's um, relationship with the Joker were both things that are supposed to be completely unappealing. And like they're supposed to be skin crawlingly like unnerving and like weird. But yeah. they were very much like, no, like, Harley Quinn's super sexy. Like, let's have her undress so you can, like, think she's hot. And it's like, no, like, Harley Quinn uses her sexuality as a weapon. And that's supposed to be, like, something that she uses to, like, get the upper hand on people. Not so that, like, all of the 16-year-old guys in the theater can, like, you know, come in their hands, right? Like, Whoa, this is, like, graphic. completely, <laughs> this is, like, completely offensive. Yeah. Like, give her a pair of pants. Nobody, no self-respecting villain, like, carries around a baseball bat with, like, a thong 
You know, like she's no. not stupid. Well, and she's, she's wearing like Christian Louboutins the whole time. <laughs> It's like she has way more respect for her shoes than that. Like I've seen the cartoon. <laughs> but I feel like that was also like they completely didn't understand the yeah. relationship between Joker and Harley Quinn. Really abusive. And they didn't under like they wanted to get you to the point where it was like they love each other. They're all about each other, you know? And it's like, no, they should like be obsessed but with none each of other, it, which is totally And none of it felt you know? earned anyway. Because like regardless yeah. of how they would have set up the relationship, it was just shown to you in like like I could have done a PowerPoint. That was more convincing. Because <laughs> that's basically I what it was. I would love to see the PowerPoint version of this movie. Do you re- do you remember <laughs> the scene where like with Harley Quinn and she like escapes and she's like she was like bye and then she like flies off and then like the airplane crashes like literally two and, seconds later and then, and then the Joker is supposedly dead and she's like oh my goodness oh well darn it and she just like sits she just, like sits on a car sits on a car and waits yeah, for the other just, like, villains to, to come get her and then they like hug her or whatever like we're family now Harley. yeah <laughs> it's just like um are you not gonna search for him or whatever <laughs> and then he like randomly comes back to life. Well, and it's also, like, yeah, Joker is constantly just following Harley Quinn around, like, the movie, just, like, trying to save her. Yeah. And she's constantly just like, oh, my pudding will come. <laughs> Mr. And, like, J. <laughs> and I well, think you're right. I, like, she, I feel like she <laughs> forgot that she had an accent for, like, half the scenes. That was my one thing. Like, occasionally she would bring <laughs> on, like, a true. super heavy accent, and then they'd be like, oh, oh no, 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 Margaret, like, you, you, uh, like, you're supposed to be, like, you're from, like, Jersey. And she's like, oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she would do it for like a long or two. Oh, right, 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 right. Oh, there you go. I got it. (laughs) Like, also, but. Um, I do want to talk about. Wait, I have one more question. What was the Joker? Like, I watched the entire movie and, like, was he a drug dealer? Like, was he a pimp? I think he was supposed to be a mob boss. Was he a criminal? Like, why was he in a dirt room hotel, a dirt floor hotel room with a bunch of knives? Like, what? What was he doing there? What what was going on with this? Like, who was he? Yeah. I I, I honestly am asking you because I I don't know. I don't know. No, like we don't know either. We saw the same movie. Will (laughs) I have no idea. Apparently, there were a lot of scenes that got cut, and like Jared Leto was super pissed because there's a lot of Joker stuff that just didn't make it into the movie, which I totally believe. I totally believe that we saw pieces of a much messier puzzle, and they just. They were just like, okay, like, fuck it. Like, here's what you get, you know? Like, yeah. this doesn't make sense. So here's, like, the least offensive out of all of this stuff. And you could really tell. And f- like, and it wasn't even, like, in chronological order. Which, for no, how was, many flashbacks was, there are in that movie, you cannot go nonlinear on the audience. Like, that actually makes me mad. It's like, everybody was getting flashbacks, and they didn't even bother to, like, put them in chronological order for us. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. fuck you. <laughs> Like, and I think, like, my biggest... do I have to do as an audience member to watch this movie? My biggest problem with, like, the... Specifically with the directing and the writing, because David Ayer wrote and directed this movie, um, and he's known mostly for, like, cop dramas, and he, like, wrote Training Day and, like, military dramas and yeah. stuff. So he's, like, a very kind of... And, and I feel like that was extremely to his detriment in this, because if you're going to go with Harley Quinn and the Joker as these kind of like versions, which are loosely based on like the more freewheeling kind of like crazier, you know, like superheroes mm-hmm. and stuff like, like the more strange it, it works in like the animated series, for example, because like Joker's so weird and Harley's so weird and all of their henchmen and their whole vibe is weird. But in this, it was like Joker was weird and all of his henchmen were just like dudes. Like they were just like, mil- yeah. like everybody, everybody in the movie outside of like the, the five uh, villains that you kind of follow are just normal ass military people and like it clashed so horribly with like the supposed kookiness and weirdness of like the joker and harley and and uh you know killer croc and all these things like it doesn't make sense it just it felt so weird to have somebody who's like uh, you know a big cop and an army like movie writer and director to be writing that stuff that he knows and then just try to cut and paste like kooky wacky superheroes over it like it just totally mm-hmm. was so broken and that i mean that was just my final thought on this like in terms of just writing and directing like just that that pastiche of like half of it wanting to be serious and like an off a, you know a a swat movie and then half of it wanting to be like unhinged weird joker with tattoos and a fucking grill 
Joker had a fucking grill. Like, <laughs> yeah. it just didn't it didn't well, make sense like... together at all. Yeah, I feel like the actual when you're talking about like the actual performance, just jumping off of that into my last thought on Joker was that the actual performance of Joker, like Jared I, Jared Leto actually like delivering lines, did not feel that different to me than like Heath Ledger, in terms of like they were just doing like Heath Ledger in like a different world that like didn't uh, make yeah sense. yeah is what I felt like. So like when it comes to like I was like if if they had like a decent script with like good writing. And he was delivering, like, good lines and, like, the plot made sense and, like, the direction was clear. I probably wouldn't have cared, like, that Jared Letter was Joker. If, if 90% like, of this worked. movie had been different, it wouldn't have been bad. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, like, yes. Like, <laughs> you know those quotes they put on the DVD of, like, <laughs> <laughs> that should be it. Just on the front of it okay, says, like, he has a grill, an I actual fucking grill. Get a <laughs> oh my god, Will, like, he's gonna have a grill for the rest of time. Like, you need to let it go. <laughs> Dude, I'm just not okay with that. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, it's weird. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, the rest of this movie. Yeah. Like my big movie. thing, my biggest thing about this movie, the thing that pissed me off the most, besides, like, Harley Quinn over-sexualization, and basically the over-sexualization of every, like, under, like, 40 woman in this film, which, I mean, we could talk about for days, but, like... Oh my god, why would Katana well wear a belly shirt? Any reason? No, there's no fucking reason. Okay, Dude. moving on. Like I don't um I don't know. My big my big thing was like they were like it was like zero to sixty in terms of like the villains' relationship with each other. It was like, hey, like yeah. we should like escape. Like, oh my god, we're family. Oh my god, like <laughs> we're like family. Whoa. Like, they're my friends, they're my family. I'm gonna like throw myself off a building for you. Like, I've known you for, like, five minutes. Like, yeah. I feel the connection. <laughs> That's how I felt. Like, completely. Yeah, no, I mean, that goes back to the Joker Harley thing. Like, I think every, yeah. every single plot point in this movie is completely unearned by the writing and directing yes. of it. None yes. of it yes. earns anything yes. that it presents you, presents a bunch uh-huh. of bullshit and expects you to swallow it and doesn't give you reasons or or uh, you know any indication as to why you should go along with anything that's happening yes it's just a fucking and like, garbage it didn't, pile i feel like if you're comparing it to something like guardians of the galaxy which you could tell it was trying to like imitate the reason that guardians of the galaxy works the reason that you are okay with those relationships is because you're having fun the action mm-hmm. is entertaining. The filmmaking makes, like, chronological, like, just basic filmmaking sense. The actors are given the right dialogue to, like, bring out their natural charisma. And, like, Suicide Squad just did none of that. Because, like, you'll nope. swallow almost anything if you're having a good time. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. it doesn't even yeah. need to, like, make... I'm not even asking them to, like, make sense at this point. I'm just asking them to, like, have fun. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I can't believe I'm saying that out loud. Like, no, it's true, though. A little bit. You'll swallow anything as long as it's entertaining. Isn't Shut that what you said? <laughs> <laughs> um, can you, like, cut that No, out? I think that's true. <laughs> I mean, like, with Guardians, like, there's things that you could, like, you, you could get nitpicky with any of these superhero movies. You know, like, yes. you could get down to, like, the, the, the goofiness of a lot of things, but they're so enjoyable that there's a suspension of disbelief and a... And just like, you know, like you're saying, like a general willingness to follow where they're leading you. But this, like, I just had no interest in, in following. <laughs> it's just crap. Okay, Ethan, any final thoughts on Suicide Squad before we, like, move on to, like, Warner Brothers and, like, mm-hmm. that shit pile? So <laughs> earlier at the beginning of the podcast, I mentioned Electra <laughs> with Jennifer Gardner. And yep. I gotta say, I've changed my mind. I think, <laughs> and I actually think you'll agree with me. I think Electra with Jennifer Gardner made more chronological sense than Suicide Squad. <laughs> and I enjoyed it more because I like Electra a lot. But if that if that is a measurement of how good Suicide Squad is, I think if you've seen Electra, you will know that by, by that comparison, Suicide Squad is not just garbage, <laughs> um, but it needs to be locked in a box <laughs> and buried in the ground. But Mar- no, Margot Robbie can stay. She's like, cool. Like, Margot Robbie can, like, help bury the box. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my yeah. God. Okay, Real this bad. is a good segue, I think. We should talk about the DCCU. Yes, yes, we should. We mm-hmm. definitely need to. Will, you sent what might be my favorite 
thing I've ever received so ever in my life. Great. And I've like gotten computers, okay? <laughs> you sent me a link to an open letter to Warner Brothers from a former employee. Why don't you explain what's going on in that letter? Maybe read the, your favorite part or whatever. Uh, sure. I mean, I don't really, I don't have it in front of me, but I can paraphrase what I'm was going it on. Yeah. It was it was basically a letter from a former employee of Warner Brothers, and it, it sort of starts out talking about how they were this person. I for some reason I'm thinking it's a female, but I don't know why. I I don't know if she said I don't know if that's true or not. I just, for some reason that's just in my mind. Um, and this person goes on this kind of tirade about how, uh, like there were layoffs <laughs> recently and or in, maybe that was a couple years ago, like Warner Brothers lost 10% of their company and how they were just like selling shit to all the employees about how they were focused on like their creative endeavors. And sometimes you have to go through tough times to like create the best products and stuff. And then this person proceeds to like list the series of films that Warner Brothers has ungodly butchered and destroyed and killed the mind share of to everybody. Um, I don't have the list in front of me, but it's pretty extensive <laughs> of all the crap that Warner it's Brothers Jupiter has shoveled Jupiter Ascending, out. Get Hard, Hot Pursuit, Max, Vacation, Pan, and Point Break were the ones that she made. And then she says... She's... Fucking Pan, you jerk. <laughs> 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 yeah, so like basically it's this letter about how Warner Brothers has systematically destroyed you know, tons of properties and ideas, whether they be remakes in the case of you know Point Break and Pan and stuff, or just original movies and and how basically the every man working at warner brothers in accounting or whatever is being punished for the uh like horrendous filmmaking and creative endeavors of directors like Zack snyder and it's talking about how Can i actually read what? my favorite part oh yeah is it the end about like that? pancakes <laughs> yeah I i'm gonna read my yeah. favorite two paragraphs are you ready okay <laughs> I have to, like, do her justice. She's a genius. <laughs> wait, it, wait, do we know for sure the writer's a woman? She uses, like, a female pseudonym. Oh, does she? Yeah. Okay. So I'm assuming. But I mean, it doesn't yeah, really matter. I, I, I'm going to call it I assume she was. Go do it. Do yeah. it. Zack Snyder is not delivering. Is he being punished? Assistants who were doing fantastic work certainly were. People in finance and in marketing and in IT, they had no say in a movie called Batman v Superman only having eight minutes of Batman fighting Superman in it. That ends because their moms have the same name. <laughs> Snyder is producing every DC movie. He is still directing Justice League. He is being rewarded with more opportunity to get more people laid off. I'm assuming you yourself haven't been financially affected in any real way. You and your studio are the biggest lesson about life one can learn. The top screws up and the bottom suffers. Peter Jackson phones it in and a marketing supervisor has to figure out a plan B for house payments. If I worked in a donut stand and I kept fucking up donuts, I'd be fired. Even if I made a tiny decent one every now and then, it doesn't matter. I'm going to get fired. I love this studio and you're allowed to sink it. It's not about making movies for the fans and not the critics. It's not even about ruining childhoods. It's about protecting livelihoods. It's time to wake up and make fucking donuts, Kevin. Oh, so <laughs> good. She, like, red hair. That is really she, good. Like, red There's hair. so much shade. I love it. Yeah. It's so smart. Yeah, so, I highly I mean, recommend basically... you guys go find it. Well, we should link it in yeah, the YouTube it's, video. It's yeah, quite a good letter. Some, yeah. It's called an yeah, open letter to the Warner SoundCloud Brothers. And I'll, I'll link it in the uh, yeah. Facebook post. Yeah, there'll be links in the YouTube video then. Yeah, yeah. definitely go yeah. read it. It is so good. Like she talks about like insider studio stuff that like you when you read it, you're like, oh, yeah, like that makes total sense. But you don't think about when you're at the theater, yeah. you know, mm. really, really good. Yeah. So, so I mean, basically the question that, that it to us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go for it. So you sent that to us and we're like, here, like Christmas, you're welcome. And we were like, oh my God, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it, it brings up a lot of really interesting questions. I think you wanted to talk about just like the DCCU and, and Warner Brothers. Like what were your, what were your big takeaways from this? Yeah. I mean, like the question is like uh, one, I think that she's right. Like it, it really is unfortunate that these things are being, uh, you know, that the failures of these particular creative individuals are being shoveled off onto people who have no ability to make a better movie. You know, if you are in it and accounting, like she's right, you can't make a better movie. Like you can only try to do what you can and then lose your job. If it's, if it's shit, I think it also like points to the fact that you can't put like, you can't just dump money into something and expect it to be fixed. Like 
it doesn't matter how much money and star power you put into the Hobbit or into uh, Suicide Squad or into Batman vs Superman. Like it doesn't matter how much money you put in, you can't build a house on you know shit foundation. Like you just can't. You know it it, it will not stand on its own. And so I think like Warner Brothers yeah. is just in this like creative crisis space and. You know, specifically with the DCEU, the question is, like, is it even salvageable? Like, what, where are yeah. we at this point with the mindshare of, like, moviegoers? You know, and it's this uh, the, the whole, like, Warner Brothers, like, positioning themselves as making things for the fans instead of the critics. That's an entirely different discussion and a pretty, like, fucked up thing, actually, in, in my opinion. Like, to try to do this populist play to, like, pass yeah. off the shit that you're shoveling into people's faces. Like... That's just it's bullshit. Like, no, that's like but, what you want. You like want yeah, like, bad it's, movies. It's like yeah, it's what? crap. No, I mean the, the real question is like this movie. I believe um, I actually don't know about Batman vs Superman. I'll look this up real quick. But this movie, I think, was the first movie that was um, that would have had Jeff Johns' involvement. Um, more... Yeah, it, he was on. He was credited on this movie along yeah, with like, exactly. eight like other people in the same. So like, he with help from or produced by. Yeah, he is not listed as a producer on Batman vs Superman, at least on the wiki page. So this would have been the first movie that he like got his hands on. And a couple of um, episodes ago, we mentioned that he was leaving comics to become the uh, like a producer. And I think since then he's promoted, been promoted to like the president of uh, like DC Entertainment, like expanded universe stuff. So. I mean, like, the question is, you know, if, if you are, if you're this many movies in, like, you know, Man of Steel, certainly bad. Batman vs. Superman, you know, awful. Suicide Squad, arguably worse than any of them, and if not worse than at least as bad. Um, yeah. Like, you know, and then even before that, the only movie I can think of was, like, Green Lantern, which I guess technically is not part of the universe, but, like, it's not. was also crap. So, like, yeah. I, I guess... The thing is, you know, like, what do you what do you do now? And you know, with Snyder still still on Justice League, um, and and him being at least someone involved in, in all of this stuff, like, is it even possible uh, for somebody like Johns to come in and and save this and keep going? Or like, mm -hmm. is it is it really time to, you know, cut this at you know nip it in the bud and you know get Snyder and Ayers and all of these like grim ass, you know, boring filmmakers, get them the hell out of there and and reboot it with a fresh team, you know, in five years. And like, I don't know what I think about that. Like, do, how how long do, do you, you keep riding this anything? crazy train? Yeah. Um, so earlier you were talking about how um, you can't guarantee a good film with money and you made a, a comparison to like a house and if the mm. foundation is bad. You can't build a good house. Um, here's the thing. <laughs> if you have millions of dollars, there is no reason why you can't fix that stupid foundation and make a good movie. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. there is no excuse for the budgets that they have for these films that they should be bad at all. You can hire the best people in the world, the best filmmakers. Yeah. And they don't. And it's so clear that the reason these movies are bad is because they're built to make money. Yeah. You know? Like, there's no... Yeah. There's no... Nobody in the world could watch Batman v Superman and be like, wow, that's like a passion project. Like, somebody exactly. really loved... <laughs> like, somebody really loved making that movie. And, like, even though it's not for me, like, I can respect it, you know? Which is sad because I still think that Zack Snyder thinks he's, like, an artist. Like, I am sure... Zack Snyder like wakes up in the morning like super content with like his filmmaking you know and yeah. to me it's like it's not Zack Snyder's fault that he can't direct his way out of a paper bag like not everybody's a director that's not like offensive to me what's offensive to me is that Kevin and Joff and all of the assholes over there who should be able to tell a good story from a bad look at Zack Snyder's filmography and are like yeah like this is our guy this you know? is the guy yeah 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 and, it, yeah. Yeah, and I'm not even like to me, it's just, like, mind-boggling that they still think, like, he's their best shot for, like, the world that they want. Because it's so clear from his filmmaking that Zack Snyder needs, like, it handed to him, you know? Like, 300 was good because he made a shot for shot remake of the comic. And I did not like Watchmen at all. I thought it was a terrible movie. But there is some great cinematography in there because of the 
stuff that he had to pull from, you know? And the story works yeah, because yeah. he was pulling from directly from source material. So if you told me that they were going to, like, J- Jeff Johns was going to write the script and Zack Snyder couldn't touch it in any way, shape, or form, and that he was co-directing with Ben Affleck, then I'd be like, all right, like, you understand who you have. You know what I mean? Because I think visually he's the right guy for what they're going for, but storytelling-wise, he's not. I just... And in terms of your question of, like, should they start over? Yeah, they mm-hmm. absolutely should. And it really sucks because I feel like the casting of the DCCU has been, up until this point, excepting for Wonder Woman, flawless. Like, they have been getting the right people for the job since day one in terms of on-screen talent. And I'm sure, like, a lot of people behind the camera are all doing an amazing job, too. And now, because, like, they could not have the the fortitude of conscience to be like all right like we need to like pull in a board after man of steel like they've completely like screwed over all of this a-list really sick talent that they have that i'm gonna be sad to see go if they do the right thing and like start over do you know what i mean because i Mm -hmm. like ben affleck as batman i like jeremy irons as alfred i like um henry cavill as superman i like all of the cast of Suicide Squad. Like, I liked the casting of Suicide Squad. Yeah, no, I like, don't think he, any of these movies are the fault of of bad acting. They're actors. Yeah, yeah, which, I mean, it's like, it's so clear to me that, like, they had gold and they threw it away, you know? Like, they just were like, hey, all this talent, like, that we, like, went through all this trouble to get, we're just, like, not gonna utilize it. Do you know what I mean? Like... Yeah. And it's so clear that they were getting these names so that they would be screen draw. Like they wanted they wanted Ben Affleck so that they could say like Ben Affleck as Batman. Not because Oscar they wanted winner, like, a decent actor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they absolutely should start over. I do not think they will. I think they're gonna oh. run this into the ground. Um the open letter made allusions that Wonder Woman is not very good, and I totally believe it. Like I don't care how Yeah, I'm interested to looks, see what even I'm though I didn't to like see what it. That is. I'm absolutely expecting it to be a disaster. I'm expecting it to be full of, like, girl power references, completely understand- misunderstanding <laughs> feminism. I'm sure it's going to be highly offensive. I still think Gal-, Gal Gadot was absolutely the wrong choice for Wonder Woman. Like, and I think she's actually a decent actress. Like, I was, I liked her in Batman v Superman, but she totally doesn't embody what Wonder Woman is. Mm-hmm. She's, all, um, she's much too subdued, or at least this version of Wonder Woman that they have to me is, like, yeah. Um, well, and that's not, not to say that it's her that fault. It's not her. No, yeah, it's exactly. like someone offered her the role, and it's their fault. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. in the same way that, like, I'm not mad at Cara Delevingne for being a bad, like, Dr. Moon. Like, the minute she came into the room, it should have been like, she's too young. She won't play well with Rick Flagg. She won't play well with others. Like, she's not ready for this. Like, she's allowed to be a bad actress. She's allowed to, like, begin her career as not the perfect actress. Yeah. And, like, work her way into better roles, you know? Like, I'm okay with mm. that. I'm not mad at Cara Delevingne. I'm mad at all these people who are making decisions based on how much money each decision will make. Who are yeah. breaking down, like, action sequences in terms of dollar signs and how much they think that those will return in the box office, you know? It's like, no, why don't you just let somebody, like, make a movie? The reason Christopher Nolan's Batmans worked was because they were Christopher Nolan's Batman. Yeah, that's what Does I was going to say. The, the thing, like, yeah, the thing that we'll never know, and I think is... I mean, well, I guess we could know, because now, like, the director's cut or extended or whatever of Batman vs. Superman is, is out there. I haven't seen it yet. But the thing that I am would want to know is, like how much of these movies are just lost to editing and production choices of Warner Brothers? You know, like, like, is there somewhere out there a cut of Suicide Squad or a cut of Batman vs. Superman that isn't, you know, total garbage? Like, what is there? Is there a piece of what was filmed that is salvageable and presentable? Like, and then the studios, when they go into editing and into, you know, like, test audiences they just whittle that down into into garbage? Or is it that, like, just foundationally these movies were never quality to begin with? And I don't I don't know the answer I to that. I promise like, you, I promise you it's both. I promise <laughs> you Zach does not column understand <laughs> character enough to have a foundation. Oh, yeah, no, no, like, like the writing, I think the writing like, across the board, like, the, is, is horrendous. Like, the scripting and the writing is... is total trash garbage in the DCEU. Like, my question would be, like, just in terms of literally watching, like, you were talking about the chronology and the flashbacks and the unexplained (laughs) scenes, like, just watching Suicide Squad, like, 
even if the writing is trash, is there a cut somewhere that like that you can just kind of make sense of? Because it's so undecipherable as it is. Yeah. And I like I don't know. It's and I the question on like on Suicide Squad as well is like how much involvement did somebody like Jeff Johns have in it? Because like I have somewhat you know conf- some amount of confidence in his ability as a as a coherent storyteller and scripter. And it, was it a case of like by the time he got there, it was just so really? far gone I don't that like you know he couldn't any do anything measure of like real I don't believe he did either squad, yeah I don't think so it's, either it was too late by the time he got on so he I'm wondering like edited. yeah so the question is like going forward you know is is this going to be the last bad one <laughs> like like is it is this enough to and and I I think the answer is no because it doesn't matter to them because you can make like we said care. at the beginning yeah. Well, because they already made three hundred million dollars. Because there is a contingency of people, just like there are people that go out every year and buy Call of Duty. You know, regardless of what people think, there will always be some amount of people that buy Call of Duty. You know, there will always be some amount of people that buy the new Batman book when it comes out, regardless of who's writing it or who's doing it or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like there will always be, you know, two hundred million or one hundred and fifty million dollars of ticket sales to people who will go out and see the next DC movie. Like, it does not matter what the hell it is. So as long as they can keep spending, you know, $150 million or fewer on all these movies, it doesn't fucking matter. Which sucks. Like, it totally sucks. But, like, they are just going to keep making back and doubling their money and then making the next crap pile. And, like, if, if you don't hurt them financially... They will never listen and never change it. Yeah. And I don't know like what well, the I mean, answer to that is. Movie sales have been going down steadily for the last like five years. Like this is the worst mm-hmm. year for Hollywood in terms of ticket sales. But like nobody cares about and that's like US, but it's the international market that drives yeah. all of these decisions. Like every single yeah. decision is based on like what will China like the most, you know? Like Well now it's interesting because you know, did you is. see like Ghostbusters, for example? is probably not going to be getting a sequel because financially it didn't work because it didn't open yeah. in China. And, like, it's just interesting yeah. that, like, that that kind of planning goes into it to such an extent that it pollutes the, you know, integrity of any creative force, in my opinion, at least. Like, there is yeah. no... there There is nothing left, to, like, to stand on creatively if that's how you are planning your film slate. <laughs> like, it's just crap. Yeah. I yeah. mean, can you... Can you make decisions for making significant money on film while also making good films? Like, is that compatible? Or do you sort of just have to toss, you know, trying to... The the idea of making money and make a good movie. You can, like... Okay, James Cameron is one of the highest grossing directors of all time. And his biggest films were original ideas. Mm -hmm. And whether or not you like Avatar, like, that was his brainchild. He did it because he Mm -hmm. liked it. You know? Like, he did it because he wanted to. I'm a pretty big proponent that Avatar is highly enjoyable and like I get what the criticisms of it but at least he was trying to do something that like came from him like as a creator he'd been developing that world for years you know and like I would much rather see things like Avatar where like you give a creator the opportunity to do something they've been wanting to do for forever and like hey it, it makes it big you know than, like, stuff like Suicide Squad where they're trying to play on, like, the likes and dislikes of an American audience while also making it, like, financially viable to, like, Chinese audiences too, right? Yeah, like, and I think what you were talking about with Christopher Nolan is pretty apt in this case as well, where it's, like, you know, giving somebody something, a property, and, and giving them, like, real creative control uh, yeah. or at least an ability to, like, render their vision of it, um, you know, goes yeah. so much further further than having 10 different WB suits in the room telling you, you know, what needs to happen and what doesn't need to happen with these yeah. properties. And like, it just makes, it's just too many cooks, too many cooks spoils yes. the broth or whatever that's saying is. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's pretty clear that like there are directors out there who can still like make their money, you know, like yeah, absolutely. And who have enough like um, power in the room with the studio director directives or studio execs to like be like oh you want a second batman or you want a third batman like fine i'm making inception like you think you think i'm just gonna do it for free like you think i'm just so grateful to be making your movies 
Like, no, like, this is a give and take. Like, and then Inception, you know, is a runaway success. And one of the things they can be, like, most proud about. I just, like, it's so clear that the balance of power in those meetings is so just, like, uneven. Does that make sense? Like, it just Mm -hmm. doesn't, it's not, there's no longer any, like, oh, we're, like, we're in this together. Like, we're all making movies together. It's like, no, like, you're making the movie we want you to make. And unfortunately, those movies all, like, suck. So I guess what we're trying to say is on the chance that Zack Snyder or any person who has control at Warner Brothers is listening to this, I have two things to say. First off, F you. (laughs) F you. Please pay for my tuition. (laughs) Learn what feminism is. And then point number two get better creators yeah like yeah. it's so clear that it's this like they're out there you know what i mean like, they exist i think some of them are even here our friends people that are li- you can f- go anywhere literally people who are interested in this and spend a lot of time doing it are going to be good it's obvious that like whoever this person is Zack snyder is like well first off he's rich and if you want to date me fine cool let's do it <laughs> <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is that finding talent is not that hard. It's not that hard. I mean, I go to a school that, I mean, isn't like a huge school. And I know a, quite a few people who are really talented. And that's just in this small town. I'm sure it'd be very easy for them to find someone that can make a phenomenal movie. Yeah. Like, if you want me to direct the next DCCU, like, I'm totally available. And her Instagram <laughs> is. <laughs> Like, I'm interested. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's it's kind of tricky because it's like they're going for a thing that I think is, uh, you know, I've talked about it a lot with the Marvel Universe versus the DC Universe cinematically where Marvel, like, purposefully um, positions themselves as having, like, a bunch of different, a a bunch of quite wildly different uh, tonally. Uh, films yeah you know like they they really go for like genre films and uh and uh, like quite a quite a big i don't know if emphasis is correct but but quite a big like ability for a director to just do something in their own genre whereas like dc has very purposefully you know selected one person or a handful of people to like craft uh something that is like tonally consistent throughout and you know it's just sort of like a it's a bigger risk to some extent you know because like if a Marvel mm-hmm. movie, like, let's say Thor or whatever, like, I'm not wild about Thor. You know, the first one was done by Kenneth Branagh, I believe, and uh, directed by Elisa. Yeah. I don't know who wrote it. And it's kind of like, you know, he gave the, it kind of that, like, you know, I don't want to say Shakespearean, but that kind of, like, theatrical, like, larger, you know, pomp and circumstance element to it. And, like, I don't think it personally worked. And that's cool. Like, you have one film out of the universe that, like, maybe isn't my favorite. But it's like, if you had tasked Kenneth Branagh with doing the entire universe and he's like in charge of of you know create crafting a tone for it then you get three films in and you're like well shit like what what did we do here you know and that's what I feel like yeah. the problem is with DC is like if you're going to go for that tonally consistent thing like like even Wonder Woman you know like you look at it and the way it's shot like the trailer you're just like oh yeah like this is a DC movie like the way it uses light and the way, like, it frames things and the kind of, like, the slow motion action and the sparks and everything. Like, it just, it looks tonally consistent and visually consistent with DC movies. And, yeah, like, it, you know, you're getting to a point where it's like, I don't want Marvel's way to be the only way that works. Like, I, I don't want that yes. to be the, you know, the only thing that could ever happen with comic book movies is where you have all these disparate pieces and then you come together for the Avengers like every two years and and it's, you know, I don't want that to be the thing, but it's like, if you're going to be that, you know, set yourself on that path and be kind of like, you know, I don't know if brave is the right word, but be, you know, confident enough in picking somebody to define an artistic vision, just for the love of Jesus, don't make it Zack Snyder. Like, holy crap, you know, like, <laughs> like there's, there's so many people and so many things out there that you could choose to define your vision and, and your, like, the direction of the universe. And it's like, you just bet on a bad horse, dude. Like, you just, you just yeah. did, you know, like you, it, it was not a strong 
pick. It wasn't a long term. Well, the horse has literally had all its legs cut off, and they still keep like betting on it. They keep like rolling it down the track. (laughs) And you know, and I think part of the problem might be that, like, (laughs) part of the problem might be that, and I'm not gonna, you know, I don't want to get too negative about it, but like, I think some, what you might, you know, self-respecting filmmakers might not want to do that. You know, like like Christopher Nolan, for example, like if he was the you know the the direction of the universe if he had been helming this entire project in a more direct way like you know we would have a totally different thing but it's like you can't really he is somebody who has creative interests and you can't really like pin him to that you know it feels like snyder is somebody who's kind of like oh yeah like i would love to do that like i would love to just be your bitch boy and do whatever you want for years like you know it, it's frustrating that it can't you, you can't find somebody who has, like, a little bit more creative integrity to lead that because I don't know if they're really honestly interested in it. Like, I don't know if they have that that yeah. ability to sit down and be the director of all of these movies and be the, the behind-the-scenes man that ties it all together. Like, I don't think there are well, many directors that, who want to do that. Something that something that Marvel did really well was, like, mine, like, underutilized talent from, like, TV as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah. they were... They were not just like, oh, give, let me get the biggest names. Let me let me go find the Christopher Nolans. They did not go out and just get all the Christopher Nolans of the world to direct Marvel movies. Yeah, like, yeah. John Favreau, before he <clears throat> made Iron Man One, was just making like charming little quirky films that he really enjoyed. You know, yeah, which is awesome. Yeah. Like that's how they should be mining their talent. And DC has very clearly de- like shown us that they are incapable of doing that. It's almost like they look around and they're like, well, nobody's good enough. So I guess like Zack Snyder, and it's like yeah, wow, like you have no, like. you don't you don't even like pay attention to your own industry, do you? Like you're not even looking c- for somebody who's willing to come in and be like, okay, like I've been doing like a couple episodes of Game of Thrones here and there, like I've proven myself that I can do this like darker tone, because let's be real, like television is the way people like get noticed in the industry. Mm-hmm. And when you jump on Game of Thrones, you're not gonna be like, yeah, like I'm gonna like come to Game of Thrones and like make like my Wes Anderson version of like Game of Thrones. <laughs> I've always been yeah, exactly, up. yeah. No, you understand the tone of the project and you deliver on that and you deliver good episodes. And you could easily have a DC cinematic universe where that is the deal, where they're constantly like mining the talent of like HBO, of like the bigger networks, of like even Netflix, you know? Like, the Daredevil directors, the Jessica Jones directors, the Stranger Things directors, yeah. right? Like, they're out there. They're not, like, who understand this darker, grittier tone and bring them to the DCCU, give them Green Lantern, give them The Flash, give them Cyborg, and be like, okay, here's your movie. Like, we respect you as an artist. Keep it in this, like, keep it in this range, but also, like, <clears throat> bring your own thing to it. We want to see what you can do, you know? Yeah. Like, this is not... Like, there are a lot of self-respecting artists out there who would kill for a shot at a big-budget movie, you know, to get their feet under them so they can go on and do the projects that they want to do. Like, this is not a bad platform to launch people into their careers, you know? Like, they could totally make that work. Yeah, and And I mean, like, I think so far, like I said, they've just just bet on bad, you know, candidates so far. And I think my my biggest uh, hope for the extended universe right now is uh james wan on uh, aquaman like i have i have some hope that because he is like independently (laughs) what's up it's gonna be terrible he's gonna make oh i mean ride like a water jet scooter yeah no i mean and that's what i'm saying like (laughs) i don't i i i am fully expecting it to not be good but like somewhere in my in my heart i have a holdout that you know like he is a respected and interesting genre horror film director. Like, he has done it before independently and with smaller companies. And, like, let's see if he can do it again. And the question is, are they going to let him do that and get his hands on it like they want? Or does, you know, does it have to be, again, the Zack Snyder, Justice League, drinking and tribal tattooed, like, trash Aquaman that, that we you know, have presented to us now. It's, that's just the question is like, how will they let him do something that can be interesting? Or like, does it have to be under this like oppressive boringness that Snyder has blanketed the universe with so far? And I don't, I don't know what the answer is until it comes out, but I hope it's not. (laughs) I hope, I hope there's some, you know, escape from this. I'm calling myself out. I thought James Wan was somebody else. 
I think he might. <laughs> oh, James James Wan is awesome. I love yeah. all those movies. Okay, I have yeah, Chloe and, too. <laughs> there you go. So I mean, like, and that's and I don't I, don't, I I honestly don't know who's directing Wonder Woman. Um, like from what I've seen, like I said, even though like I thought I I was kind of down with the trailer, I do think it looks um overwhelmingly uh like like DC house style of of kind of filmmaking like visually. So so um Patty Jenkins is directing Wonder Patty Woman. Patty Jenkins. There you go. I, I don't know who that is. I you know I don't know what the other she directed films Monster, are. Monster and the Killing. Arrested Development. Episodes of Killing. Okay. So she made Monster. Maybe. Wow. Yeah. So I don't know. You know I don't also... know. Like it's as we get further in. Like are these are these films gonna possibly be? You know, like I said, it it just it I just it remains to be seen how how much people are allowed to escape from the Snyderisms of the universe at, at this moment you know i don't i don't know what the answer is they're gonna be bad that's that's my feeling <laughs> I, I i agree with you like if i had to say yeah. right now like you know the fact that a studio would go as far to you know produce cut edit and put something like suicide squad out there like knowing full well i mean you have to know you have to know. Yeah. Like you have you you you, you pay critics to like, do maybe they advanced won't reviews. Notice. <laughs> <laughs> like you can you know you can't you, you know and people do mock up reviews and there's test screenings and like you you have to know it's trash. You just you just have to or you're just a blind idiot and you know, like if if a company that that knows and still you know goes through with it and doesn't take the time to make something that is quality like I just don't have confidence in them being able to to uh you know, allow these people to do anything interesting. So I don't know. Yeah. Not a, not a confident future in now my I'm opinion. I'm like all in, depressed in and sad. <laughs> we should move on to my favorite section of the show. Dude, we've already been going for like an hour and 20, but I'm down oh, for a little, I'm down for a little wrap up. Yeah. We should do a little bit. Yeah. We should do a little bit. Okay guys, we're going to be back in one second. You know why? Woo! Okay. Bye. You know why? You know why? <laughs> Mm-hmm. All right, guys, we're back with my favorite portion of the podcast, what we've been reading, watching, listening to. I'm going to just start talking like this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ethan, as our guest here, <laughs> why don't you like take it away? What have you been doing with yourself? What content have you been loving? Well, um, what have I been doing with myself? <laughs> um, <laughs> good question. Um, so, yeah, there's a couple of things that I would really like to talk about because they deserve mentioning. Um, so I'm going to start off with film because we've been talking about really disgusting filmmaking. (laughs) So I kind of want to mention a movie that, um, you should all go see. Um, me and Emmanuel last night went with a group of friends and we saw this movie. It was called Hunt for the Wilder People. Yes. Um, and it was, uh, made by this man named Taika Waititi. And I probably pronounced that wrong, which is horrible because he's from New Zealand and that's where my mom is from. But no, Taika Waititi, that sounds right. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. I don't know though. I mean, I would I'm... have said Takai. I've oh, never okay. even heard of okay. this person. So. Taika. Taika. Taika Waititi. Anyway, he's he's an amaz- a genius. He's a genius. This yeah. movie was amazing. It basically was just this beautiful story about this like super like funny kid, like the kid from Up, just like this funny fat kid who's like <laughs> really like into rap and he's also like kind of a dork but he dresses like a gangster and he gets adopted by these like two pot smoking farmers that live in the middle of like <laughs> nowhere l- nowhere in the, bush. <laughs> in the bush and um he no one has ever loved him and this like this woman who adopts him immediately like falls for him and they just have this amazing mother-son relationship don't give too much away though right but basically what i'm just gonna say is <laughs> things happen and it's just this beautiful story about this family and it's amazing. You all should go see it. Great filmmaking, yeah. great comedy, great dr- drama as well. And it was some of the best like visual filmmaking it's I've beautiful. seen. Beautiful. It's very. It feel. He feels a lot like Wes Anderson, mm-hmm. but instead of like Wes Anderson, where all the characters take place in this sort of odd Wes Anderson world, and everybody's sort of equally weird. It was like. Yeah. No, it was like Wes Anderson, but in like real life. In the real like, world. In the real world. <laughs> so it made the characters like weirder and kookier. But also like more lovable. Like mm-hmm. these are true like social outcasts who like don't quite fit in anywhere, but are also like completely normal too. It's hard to explain. Have, have you seen um Submarine? It, the uh was the Richard no. Iode movie? 
No. No, no. I, 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 I mean, I haven't seen this movie that you that that you're talking about, but submarine kind of reminds me. I don't know. You might want to check it out if you're interested. Like, it kind of has yeah. a similar feeling. Like, I would describe it as a Wes Anderson style movie, and like the filmmaking is very strong. But like you said, it's it's much more concerned with like real life <laughs> and like integrating yes. and social yeah. outcasts and stuff and not like necessarily living on a, a silly underwater research station yes. or whatever weirdness that he has yeah i don't know i just kind of reminded yes. me of that not to cut in too much but yeah no no that sounds like i mean i was in love with this movie i know so, you were too ethan yeah any suggestion that's similar i definitely want to watch yeah, yeah. I, I mean summary and i would i would really out. recommend you yeah um so next i'm gonna move on to music oh yeah okay. I too um, listen to music. <laughs> and I too listen to I've music. Co- <laughs> I am also a human person. <laughs> but um, there's a couple artists that I'd like to recognize. So, this girl, I was going through YouTube. You may have actually seen advertisements for her. She's probably spent a pretty penny to get her advertisements on YouTube. But her name is Aurora. And she sort of looks like Sia a little bit, but she's like 18 years old. And she I think she's from like the Netherlands somewhere, like Sweden or I don't know. But she yeah. makes really amazing music. It's just like all story driven and like the music videos are really beautifully shot. Um, and there's this one song she has that's called Running With The Wolves. And it's just like this beautiful song about just like sort of like letting go of everything and I listen to it whatever I want to just like dance in the shower <laughs> um, which yes I listen to music in the shower whatever but. Um, so yeah and then I'd also like to talk about lastly um, a, a podcast I've been listening to for a while actually this has been about like a four month thing for me and i've recently introduced a manny to this podcast i think i might have mentioned it but you should definitely talk about yeah. it. yeah you sold me on it so this is not my favorite podcast because this is my favorite podcast <laughs> obviously <laughs> no Thank really you for this sticking is my favorite with podcast. the script <laughs> uh, <laughs> i'm like holding like a knife to him right now <laughs> And now a message from Squarespace. <laughs> <laughs> not endorsed by Squarespace. Not endorsed at all. Okay. <laughs> um, but my favorite podcast, that's not this one, is called Oh No, Ross and Carrie. And it's so good. It's basically um, two skeptics named Ross and Carrie who are like best friends, sort of like a similar relationship to, to me and Manny. And all they do is instead of talking about like nerd culture, they like take like a like a weird like subculture of like religion or just like a, um, pseudoscience. pseudoscience or like a holistic medicine and they test it or they like like for example they recently just completed like basically the uh most like the longest running investigation of scientology which if you don't know it's really hard to investigate Scientology just because they'll come after you and they'll ruin your life. And it's also super <laughs> expensive. It's really expensive. But they managed to, like, basically get as much funds as they needed. And for several months, they, like, investigated Scientology, became Scientologists, recorded so much of, like, the stuff that they were presenting to Scientologists. It's so good. And yeah. they're so funny. But they also they also approach it in a way where it's like because sometimes you'll like get people who are atheist or skeptic and they're just like everything else is stupid, which is appropriate. I mean, I mean, some things are dumb, but they approach it in a way where it's like we're not saying everyone's stupid. If something is true, like if you're claiming something is true, I want to know. Like I want to, I want to join you. To I'm that. open to that. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So they're just like they they basically take the stance of you, someone that's going to be presented with this information. Um, and it's so funny. Yeah. They have really great chemistry. But they're also, like, surprisingly generous with the yeah. people who they're... It's not always like, oh, these people are dumb and we're, like, making fun of them. It's like, listen, we live in, like, a really complex, diverse world. Yeah. And, like, everybody's going to be silly to everybody else, you know? Yeah. Like, but we're interested in you. But, like, they did, so they, they did an episode on the, the Mormon religion, which, if you don't know, I'm Mormon. I go to BYU. Um, and they did it. They did an episode on um, Mormonism where they joined the Mormon Church. Like they, like, they got baptized. baptized. But it's really cool because at the end they're like, you know what? Like, because they asked really good questions. They decided for themselves that it wasn't true, and they were like, you know what? Like this is kind of kooky, but we love these people. Like they're good people, and they're part of the world as well. And it's sort of just this thing where like they critically analyze things, but they also accept like these are people that I can be friends with. Yeah, you know what I mean. So it's re- it's such a good podcast. Please go check it out. I know you'll love it. Yeah, it's really cool. That's interesting. 
Okay, well. Oh, wait. You need to mention the cookies, Ethan. Oh, this is the last thing. So, um, I'm a vegan, and it's really hard to find good desserts. <laughs> but me and Manny were at Sprouts. Me and Manny were at Sprouts, and we found these knockoff Oreos. Sprouts, Sprouts brand, generic, called Vanilla Sandwich Cream. They Everybody like, go, like, buy, buy them. them. It was, like, two fifty, <laughs> But they're, like, better than Oreo. Like, they're, like, buttery and, like, delicious. We're, like, high on cookies right now. <laughs> <laughs> but they're vegan, too. Like, they're, they don't have any dairy in it. Oh, my God. They're so uh, good. I can they're tell so you good. as a, so as somebody who works at Trader Joe's that all of our JoJo's uh, sandwich cookies are no, also No, no, no. Like, don't. <laughs> like, how dare you? This isn't your moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I thought that uh, just straight up Oreos were vegan as well. Oreos, are, yeah, Oreos are but vegan. But these are better. Mm-hmm. These are better though. Oh, yeah. oh okay. You're I'm welcome. sorry. I was I was misunderstanding the like crisis, these these I taste like were... someone like made them. Like yeah. they were baked by like a grandmother. Like my grandma <laughs> like, made these came cookies. back to life <laughs> wow. and she made these cookies. <laughs> and it kind of looks like she designed the packaging too. Yeah, like, like it's kind of shitty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Will. What have you been eating? I mean, listening to. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really been eating anything interesting or something. Um, I have been... Fries. Lots of fries. <laughs> Lots of fries. The, uh, so I saw a movie, maybe, this was actually two weeks ago, um, because, but we didn't record last weekend, but yeah. I saw a movie that was quite, uh, really jarring, really, I, I don't know if messed me up is the right word, but like. I thought about it for a while after, and that was um, Bone Tomahawk. Have you heard of that? Hmm. No, I haven't. It, tomahawk? It was r- very Bone interesting. Tomahawk. Bone Tomahawk. It was a movie from last year. It was the directorial debut of this um, person called S. Craig Zoller, who also wrote the movie. Um, he's a singer, songwriter, musician, director, cinematographer, multi-talented everything. Um, he's written some novels. And uh, he wrote the script for this, and I think it had been bouncing around Hollywood for a while. Like, I think he's written, like, tons of stuff. Lots and lots of... He says he has maybe 21 different scripts that have been optioned or sold, and uh, none of them have been made. And so eventually he took this script that he had written that was bouncing around Hollywood and made it himself. And it is a horror western that is Hmm. really, really good and very intense and interesting. It's it's a good cast. It's kind of an ensemble cast. It's Kurt Russell, um, kind of he I think he must have filmed this around the time he did the Hateful Eight because he has a very similar uh, uh, mustache beard thing going on. It's a uh, Kurt Russell, Patrick Wilson, Matthew Fox are the uh, like major kind of characters. Richard Jenkins also one of the major characters, and then a few other ancillary characters who are also good. And um, it's basically a movie about these two kind of bandit type fellows in the, like, I guess I would pin, I don't think it ever gives a year. Maybe it does, but I think it's probably like 1880s or 90s. I don't know. Um, out, out in the Western areas. And, uh, these two bandit fellows who stumble upon accidentally a burial site of these, uh, this tribe of, of, um, Native American Indians. And it turns out that these Indians are like t- totally crazy inbred cave dwelling cannibals like that are like super not so like really terrifying and uh basically just through like happenstance and and circumstance these the one of the bandits leads these this indian tribe to a town a small town that um kurt russell is the sheriff of and once again like it just kind of through randomness the um the indy the tribe takes um one of the women from the town and so this uh, woman's husband, as well as the sheriff and uh, like the two or two of the other men from the town, all set out to go get her back. And it is terrifying. It's not like supernatural, really, in any way. It is just really, really creepy, very gory. Like uh, the violence in this is probably the best violence I've seen on film, like in a while, if not ever. Because it's so, it comes out of nowhere, like, it's not used a lot. I mean, the movie's two hours, but, oh, like, there's a long section in the middle. Like, about the, sort of, the middle hour that's just, like, a slow burn, where there's not a lot of, like, violence going on. It's just sort of building tension of, like, being out on the frontier and 
and like sleeping by you know this four guys like sleeping by a campfire and like having to worry about you know whether it's animals or like raiders or whatever and then it gets to sort of the ending bit where they find these cave indians and like holy fucking shit it kicks off in like the craziest way i mean the last 30 minutes i was just like holy shit holy shit holy shit holy fucking shit like it, it is it was so nuts and so violent but in like a i'm not gonna say tasteful at all just because i mean it is so over the top and like crazy gory and, and gnarly but um but it is done in like it's filmed and done in such a way that like keeps the violence just constantly terrifying like you never know what's gonna happen next and i mean the 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 tribes people that live in this cave are like really scary and i mean and they're just actors like in you know they're just there's no it's just actors like basically painted up in dirt but the way it's filmed and the way it's shot and put together is like is terrifying i mean i love this movie so um, we we were just like we just put on the trailer without sound while you were pitching it to us yeah and we were like there's a moment at the end of the trailer where we were both like we had like a physical reaction <laughs> yeah no no yeah. you should Dude, definitely like, go back and watch the footage i mean <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea. Like, when I was watching this, I was just, like, holding a pillow and just constantly, I was like, ah, 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 ah. Like, we especially, like. It. I was going to say that. Oh, man. The last 30 minutes are brutal. Well, and like, I'm, a, I'm a, I'm a diehard Tarantino fan. So, like, I love it, gore. Yeah. Not because and I'm a messed I'm... up person, but because I love it. And also, I'm, like, messed up. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, actually, it actually kind of reminded me of Tarantino in that sense of, like, you know, like, sometimes, like, in Hateful Eight, for example, when the violence happens, it just, like, erupts suddenly, and it's, like, really, yeah. or in any of his movies, like, it's it sort is. of, like, this yeah. this eruption of violence, and, and this captures that, like, so perfectly, like, especially, I mean, some of the way, like, this, the, this, the scenes are shot, you know, you're just getting, you're just getting shots of the characters, and then, like, things kind of come at them from off screen, and that you can't really, like, tell what's happening, and it's, it's really scary, and, like, Cool, and Kurt man. Russell is like a Tarantino actor. Yeah, so he's yeah, like he lot, is. In a lot of yeah. those movies, and I mean, and he does it. He does a really good job in this. Like, I think the casting overall is really good. Actually, Matthew Fox um, is really good in this. And usually, I'm not like hugely in love with him, but um, he plays this kind of like educated, like the only kind of like university, you know, educated man. And he's kind of like pretentious and full of himself, but he also has like a lot of kind of demons going on. And, and like I said, you get that hour in the middle where these characters just like are wandering through the wilderness and you kind of get this slow burn where they're like figuring out how exactly deep and crazy this whole thing goes. And, and you really get to like see a lot of how they interact. Like the dialogue is, is really well done. So yeah, I mean, I've basically pitched the whole thing up and down, but, um, if you are if you are into that, you know, horror western is not something I've really seen that I'm much. I'm sold. I think we're gonna um, watch it. Yeah, that sounds it's, amazing. Yeah, I I really enjoyed it. Um, I do think that depending on your tolerance for, um, for kind of like I was saying, the, the the slow burn style of like older kind of filmmaking, that the middle could drag for you depending on who you are. I mean, for me, I I really enjoyed it, but I I do I could see that happening for somebody. But the last 40 minutes yeah. makes it all worth it. And I mean, in the beginning and everything, the way it starts out is like really intense. So, yeah. Um, and I mean, I watched that and then like I went to bed and then I woke up the next morning and that the next day. And I like, I haven't thought about a movie as much as I thought about this in a while. Just kind of like, yeah, being like, holy hell, like, wow, that was something. <laughs> like, it's, it's really <laughs> something. So, um, yeah, Bone Tomahawk. Uh, I rented it on Amazon for, like, three ninety nine. I think it's on Prime. If you're a Prime member, I think it's streaming there for free right now. So, um, Oh, really? I have Prime. Yeah. Cool. Yep. So, check it out, because cool. um, it, it uh, it'll mess you up. Um, also, <laughs> I've been having a, uh, a nice uh, comic book renaissance recently. I, you know, like, I was, when I was talking on the podcast for the last couple weeks, like, I've sort of been finishing up the Conan book that I was reading, and I'm like... There are some times when I read comics and I know that they're good, and I, I, it's not that I'm not enjoying them, but, like, it sort of feels like an effort to, to like, pick up and read them. Does that make sense? Like, it's yeah. like, oh, you know, now I'll sit down and read a couple more issues, and I'll do it, and I'll be like, yeah, you know, like, I really, I thought that was good on an objective level, but, like, I'm not devouring it. But uh, recently, I read um, All-Star Superman, the uh, Grant Morrison and mm. Frank Quitely um book from i think 2005 to 2008 it's just 12 issues and like oh man it was really good really really good it was part of the all-star line where basically there weren't ever there were only like two books published in the all-star line 
And then currently it was kind of resurrected for All-Star Batman, which is going on right now with um, Scott Snyder. But uh, it's basically like giving characters the ability to... St- or giving creators, so Grant Morrison and Frank Quitely in this instance giving them the ability to just strip down the characters to like their most basic essences that they, you know, find essential and then kind of telling a story with those things. And um, I've never been a big like Superman person, Uh, you know, whether through just lack of exposure or lack of interest, I'm not sure which one is more the case, but it's just never, you know, clicked for me that much. But uh, man, this was a really good book. I, I really loved everything about it. It has kind of, a very small and and intimate cast of characters, you know, like Lois and Superman and Lex and Jimmy Olsen, and, and like, it kind of keeps everything, like, in the family, for lack of a better term, and, and, like, you really just get to see the way all these characters work together, and, like, it's so good. I, I am frequently frustrated with the way that Superman is portrayed because he kind of comes off as, like, really alien, but Grant Morrison just does this amazing job of making him, like, really emotionally intelligent, and, like, really being a son of, you know, Earth and the Kents, like, as much as as any other part of him. And, you know, like, they sell it so well. And, like, the way he interacts with the characters, it doesn't come off as that, like, kind of, you know, like, Man of Steel aloofness. Um, like, it really genuinely comes off as somebody who grew up in middle America and is, like, now trying to figure out the big city, but is also, you know, a superhero, but has the, like, like I was saying, the emotional... Um, like, understanding and the wherewithal to, like, be a supportive and, like, righteous person as a superhero. I don't know. It's something that, like, usually I'm not super into. Like, I, I'm not always that down for my superheroes to be, like, as, you know, cut and dry, like, good guys. But just the way it's written and the way it's put out on the, on the page and, and done, like, it just works so well. And the Lex Luthor in this is really, really good. Like, this version of him, he, like, you know, he's this kind of genius who's just frustrated with the fact that his achievements were dwarfed by this man who, you know, Superman, who never had to try for anything, in his opinion. And and it's just it's really interesting to see, like, Lex kind of come apart. Like, his story arc is just really satisfying. Like, as he gets closer to seeing, like, what Superman goes through to be a good person, it kind of, like, undoes him to some extent. And I think that's a really interesting idea for Lex Luthor, like... Or to just kind of like have him come to fully appreciate what exactly it is that Superman is is going through, and yeah, I mean, I just I loved everything about it. I personally like Frank Quitely's art a lot, but um, I know you were saying Amani that on New X Men you didn't love him that much, so I don't know if it will be of taste to you or not. But I, really I want to give it a shot, though. Obviously, yeah. Yeah, um, and, it's, and like I said, it's only 12 issues, it tells a self-contained story, and actually the I, I got the Absolute Edition, and it was really quite interesting because there's a lot of commentary written by Grant Morrison in the end of it, where he just like breaks down all the characters, breaks down all of the events, um, and just sort of talks about what he was trying to accomplish it, with it, and just like having, reading him comment on that stuff, I, I felt also gave me like a really good and interesting understanding of it, even more so. Highly recommended. That sounds awesome. And then, lastly, I finally cracked into East of West. And uh, I don't want to mm. get too into it now because it's obviously going to be part of our um, uh, Five Things Redux episode. But um, I am really enjoying it a lot. I'm, I'm only like five issues in, but uh, oh man, it's so good. It's so, so good. I'm, I'm glad I'm, you're I'm liking loving, it. I'm loving everything about it. Um, it has some like heavy you know, pulls towards sci-fi fan or um, science fiction Western stuff. And uh, like, I-, I love the art and the design of everything. Like, it's just, it kind of reminds me of Saga a little bit. Like, it's just such smart world building and just, just yeah. comes off in like such an amazingly uh, well thought out way. And uh, yeah, I uh, really, really am liking it. So I'm sure we're going to, you know, parse it apart a little more uh, as we get into the other thing. But um just wanted to mention it now because as of as of now i can say highly recommend it really really enjoy it. <laughs> cool yeah awesome man dude we've been recording for an hour and 50 minutes should i just not go oh no no yeah absolutely you should go i'm just okay. saying like this is gonna be okay. our all-time longest yeah, it's podcast. gonna be a long ass podcast <laughs> <laughs> okay i'm just gonna go through really quick i don't think i'm gonna speak too much about what i have but i no, picked up and time. read harry potter 
Okay. I picked up and I, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I picked up and I read Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. Um, I yeah, will say it? it was very enjoyable. I think if yeah. you are a big fan of Harry Potter, if you're into that world, if you're into those characters, you're going to have a good time with it. It's a script. It's it's two plays, but it's nev- it doesn't feel nearly as full or as deep as the books, which is perfectly understandable. That's just a just a price you have to pay for making it a play, I think. Mm-hmm. And yeah. honestly, I'm excited for when the play gets to the point where it's uh, in the U.S. and it's being toured. Because the stage direction and the things that they did with the actual like acting and like the magic and the physical like sets seems like it's going to be super sick and really fun and really really great and i'm excited to see that live um is there I don't Potter know in this? if you should wait yeah yeah he it's about him and his son basically um, does it live up to like day. your ideas of what he would be as an adult like does it seem yeah i think so yeah. i think he I think J.K. Rowling has always been really good at making her characters human. So Harry Potter was never, like, too perfect, you know? In mm-hmm. fact, he was quite annoying in some of the books, which I think is <laughs> very great. Like, good. Like, honest. Like, that's how teenagers are. And, like, you know, I think, especially in The Cursed Child, they make no bones that, like, he's not a perfect guy. He's just, like, doing his best always, you know? And, like, no matter how hard you try, like, being a father is difficult and relationship with kids, like, th- they don't always, like, go well, you know? Like, they're hard. Um... And I think that really comes through. There's a lot of magic. There's time travel. Um, mm. Spoiler. So that's kind of fun. And I feel like they do it really well. It's really engaging. It does what it needs to do. There's a lot of fan call outs, which were, ended up working for me. I I was never like going to go into Harry Potter and the Cursed Child and be like, you know what? If it's not like perfect, I'm going to like hate it. You know, like mm. it's I love Harry Potter enough that like this hit me in all the right emotional places. Um, and it was sweet. It was a good story. Yeah. It's worth a read. If you're like passionate about Harry Potter, like definitely go check this out. You're going to have a good time, yeah. I think. Um, nothing to really like write home about or blow, like nothing like blew me away other than the fact that it was like good enough to like be really satisfying. And that's hard mm. enough to do. Do you think it stands think, on its own its as like if somebody went to no. see the play without no, no, being no. a Harry No, it is definitely no, for, no, the, no. for the fans. It fan, absolutely yeah. is for okay. the fans, 100%. Like you need to read all the books. Like, and if you don't like it's you're going to be so lost like you're not going to get any of it um very clearly like from the beginning like you need to have known these characters okay and i don't think that that's dangerous for them at all because it's harry potter you know yeah no i don't think so, so either i'm just smart curious move. about yeah yeah no no absolutely though this is a good question okay moving on um, I listened to Ready Player One in audiobook form. It's a book I've read and I loved. It is being made into a movie by Steven Spielberg. I think it's coming out in 2018. I'm super excited. I, for whatever reason, I got hyped up about it seeing some stuff online. So I listened to the audiobook. It is an amazing, amazing book. It's about a boy who lives maybe two generations in the future. There's an online virtual reality called Oasis, which has basically become the internet where everybody lives their lives. And there is a contest. Um, one of the creators of the Oasis passes away and he says if you solve this like game this like series of puzzles and riddles um, all having to do with like my love of the 80s like my childhood then you will inherit all of my stock and all of my money and you will like be in charge of the Oasis and there's an evil corporation who wants all that power and a young kid he unlocks the first clue and it goes off from there it is absolutely incredible it is every nerd's wet dream it and the thing about it that's really good is there's a lot of, like, call-outs to, like, fanny things and, like, you know, childhoods, like, nerd childhoods. But more than that, the main character, Wade Watts, he's just so authentically a nerd. He's awkward, he's broken, he's self-aware, he's intelligent, but he can't seem to quite make it, like, in the real world, you know? Which just... I think has become like such a universal experience for people. You know? <laughs> I was about to say speaks to, uh, like, to us. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's so honest and so well-written. It's all in first person that as much as it's like satisfying from a nerd perspective as, as every, like as much as like every Lord of the Rings and Lady Hawk reference, like really like gets you and makes you smile and all of the game, like the video game stuff is awesome. Like what really stands out is this character's emotional journey. It's so solid. It's so fun. The audiobook is amazing. Will Reaton is the, vo- like, whatever you think about him, he does, like, he is, like, the quintessential nerd. 
and him mm-hmm. reading this first person nerd voice like totally works and is awesome i highly I like recommend it it's 15 hours yeah i definitely think you should check it out if that sounds like something you'd be interested in mm-hmm. and even if not like go like take a leap like this is cool stuff <laughs> okay i would be remiss if i didn't say that hunt for the wilder people might be the best thing i've seen in cinemas this year Same. definitely go check it out um ethan was so right like it's it's magical it's yeah. it's so good um I just see that's I playing here. I, mean, I haven't even heard anything about it. Yeah, it's super not like it's super small release, but it's worth the drive. Like we drove about an hour out of our way to go see okay. it. It's gotcha. so good. Yeah, it's so good. Um, I also played a new board game with some friends. It's called Arkham Horror. It's a Lovecraftian horror game where you are nice. fighting demons and trying I to close portals to other places. Love Lovecraft so much. So this much. game was awesome. You would probably really dig it. It's a co- like it's a co-op, like um, sort of team-based board game. That's it seems pretty complicated on the surface, but once you play through the rules, like the system is actually fairly straightforward and logical. Um, and you you pick from like twenty different characters, and you each start with different stats, and you just are trying to battle monsters and close portals and find objects, and it, it's really cool. It's really really Sounds fun cool. and a good time. And it has sort of like this loose narrative that changes every time. So you can kind of go with it. And if you have a good, you know, like any board game, it's who you play with and how much fun you can have. But it, yeah. it was a lot of fun. It, it was a longer one. I think it took us like two hours okay. or a medium size, medium length game, two hours to get through a lot of good, a lot of good stuff going on there. Definitely go check it out. Um, well-built mechanics, I would say, from my experience. Okay. And the last couple of things I want to mention are music. Yes. everybody shocked. Totally floored. Let's talk <laughs> about this. The first thing I wanted to mention was a song called Gravel, De- Gravel to Tempo by, her name's Haley Kyoko. She is originally a Disney Channel star, but the reason <laughs> she is awesome is her music really kind of goes in this interesting and brave place. She is um, lesbian and she was a young lesbian, obviously at one point in her life still is, but all of her music kind of (laughs) reflects this like struggle of being gay as a young person. Um, The music videos all have these young women who are struggling through this experience of like coming out and like being in love with other girls and like what that's like as a teenager. Now, I think that, being gay has become kind of this vogue thing but nobody talks about like young lesbians you know and that in and of itself is really hard and pretty sad and sexist in a lot of ways um and i'm not taking anything away from being gay and like the gay experience but you know a lot of the conversation around homosexuality is geared towards masculine yeah, yeah masculine homosexuality And she is this young Asian woman who is coming out with these super sweet mellow tunes that are just really honest. The videos for them are really well made and I really enjoy it. Um, Her newest song, Gravel to Tempo, is really awesome. Great for night driving (laughs) and a really, really, really beautiful piece. Um, I would recommend it. If you're interested, I just like that you described it as super sweet mellow tunes, which is amazing. Yeah, I liked it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, cool stuff. <laughs> um, another super sweet mellow tune is Tilted by Christina and the Queens. She is this French artist who sings in English for some reason. She has this really great accent going on. Mm-hmm. And she is like this sort of weird, this weird lady. Her her video has like her and some really cool dancers just like doing this sort of like really interesting dance to her song that is like unlike anything it's like white hippie Beyonce, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> and it's amazing. It's really, really good. Uh, both of those songs I've been obsessed with and I've been listening to on repeat. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to mention two music videos. The songs maybe weren't my jam. Like, I won't, like, don't think I'm going to download them anytime soon. But the filmmaking of the music videos for them was absolutely out of this world mind-blowing like i couldn't believe that this kind of thing existed without me knowing about it the (laughs) first one is purity ring begin again and the second one is sun lux you don't know me both of the music videos for those two songs like go stop what you're doing right now like go online bring them up yeah they are weird they are creepy they are cinematic they are gorgeous 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 music videos so strange yeah incredible filmmaking well I'm, I'm a fan of purity ring as well yeah and i can say that i mean 
I like the music. Yeah. First and foremost. But Which it, is cool. It's an amazing music video. Like, it blew me away. I yeah. could not it's even funny that, believe um, that, like, that you would talk about the, I think with all of these songs, you've talked about the music videos to them, right? Yeah, all of the music videos are good, but the last two yeah. music videos. Were no, really I know, but it's funny. I'm just saying, it's funny sure. to me that um, like even even music is like a visual art to you to some extent. Like, cause I I'm like a huge yeah. music person, and I never watch music videos. Like, I couldn't give a shit about them. Like, I just think about the songs, and it's funny <laughs> to me that you come at, like at it from the opposite direction. I just think that's kind of neat. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I think there's something kind of nostalgic about a really solid music video. You know, cause like. 10 15 even 20 years ago the music video was the thing you know like mtv was all about the music video and that was like part of the art and now that's become like detached in a way um, maybe that's like a misrepresentation of the music industry well, right now i mean i think i think i don't know i'm not so very familiar with videos to be honest with you yeah I mean, if you go to, like, a club, it's not just music anymore. You have, like, a projector playing music videos and oh, stuff. Cool. So it's just, like... Also, though, I would say that, like, I can pretty much determine whether or not a song is going to be garbage. Whether... By, like, if the music video is also garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's unfair. <laughs> like, I have never seen a Top 40 song that, like... The music video was like, oh, my God. <laughs> this is, is this Interstellar 2? <laughs> like, it, it's always also garbage. That's funny. All right. Well, that's all I have. That was a kind of a long list. I'm sorry, guys. I hope that you go check some of those things out and you like them. <laughs> yeah, that seems no, it seems like a good list. Yeah. Awesome. Excellent. Well, yeah. whew, it's we, a good job. Well, I know. We we took a long time on this episode. Lots of things to complain yeah, about. Yeah, <laughs> I hope you I hope you have like a drink with you. I hope you've been like hydrating. <laughs> yeah. Take a take a halfway point break. I mean, I'm telling you this at the end, but 50 minutes ago you should have taken a break <laughs> but uh thank you if you if you have listened to any or all of this we would like to thank you so very much for uh, listening and watching to our podcast um we've had awesome feedback and engagement in the last couple ones so just thank you guys for being supportive yeah <laughs> you can find this podcast on facebook itunes soundcloud and now you can also find it on will's youtube channel nerd ventures we hope you will jump on facebook and give us your thoughts on the dccu give us your thoughts on you know purity ring and whatever else we talked about i can't even remember anymore <laughs> and yes i have changed my laugh based on criticism <laughs> from the last youtube video yeah, even exactly listening to your feedback <laughs> so please uh you know like check us out jump on facebook we really love to interact with you guys mm -hmm. join the conversation yeah, I mean, YouTube has been amazing for that. Like, the ability just to have people comment right there. Um, it's been really nice yeah, to, just, awesome. just to see people's comments. And uh, while you are commenting and checking us out, if you could find it in your hearts to leave us ratings, uh, reviews, or shares with your friends, it would be incredibly amazing, um, whether it's on iTunes, um, giving us stars and, and writing little things about that, or, um, you know, sharing a YouTube video or uh, a, an iTunes um or SoundCloud podcast or yeah. whatever. Any way to get it out there is uh, amazingly appreciated. And if you're Zack Snyder listening to this, <laughs> sorry, Zach. I just have to say, I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings, but make a good donut. <laughs> to make, it's time to make some fucking it. donuts, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be uh, like my go to again? phrase <laughs> when any, whenever somebody's doing shit, something shittily. It's like, it's, listen, yeah. it's time to make some fucking donuts. <laughs> and they're going to be like, what? <laughs> okay, guys. Next week on Get a Cat, Get a Horse, we are going to be going back to the comic to screen topic. We are going to talk about our favorite movies, our least favorite movies, adaptations from comics to screens. I'm really excited for this. Will's going to lead that one. It should be full of drama and excitement and, you know, car chases and, you know, lots of cool stuff. So definitely tune in for that. <laughs> I'm going to method act it out. I'm going to I'm going to go Shakespeare yeah. and all on y'all up in your ass. Yeah. Craziness. <laughs> He's going to Jared Leto this. <laughs> I'm gonna Jared Leto this motherfucker. Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you can find me uh, online at Nerd Ventures, the YouTube channel, where this will be posted in video format. Uh, you can also find my Facebook page at Nerd Ventures or The Nerd Venturer. And uh, any different social media thing, you can just search for The Nerd Venturer as a username, and I will be there somewhere lurking in the shadows when you least <laughs> expect it. 
Awesome. Where can we find you? <laughs> oh, Ethan's going to go first. Yeah. Oh, where you. can we find you, Ethan? I'm selfish. <laughs> yeah, you can find me at Instagram.com slash Ethan Illustration. Or if you have the app, like most people do, you can just go on the app and go in the search bar and type Ethan Illustration and you'll find me. Yeah, he's sick. He's a sick artist. Thank you Definitely. so much. Yeah, like, you're so welcome. <laughs> <laughs> you can find me um, under the nomer Nerd How on YouTube, Tumblr, and Twitter, and I hope you will. And all right, guys, get a cat. Get a horse. Hello, friends and listeners, and welcome to Get a Cat, Get a Horse. The gosh darn 